Thank you. <laughs> That's right, go Bruins. Don't be afraid. Thanks for being here, Barry. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. You weren't in Oakland too long ago. I saw that with Big Three. Yeah, we were here uh, maybe three weeks ago. Very cool. Yeah. How was that? You know, I mean, I hit the game winning shot. It couldn't get no better than that. I like that. Right? Against Al Harrington. Oh, it yeah. was up. And he was like, oh, yeah, we about to win this. And I <laughs> got lucky, man. Oh, I'm sure it wasn't luck. Brought but... back a lot of nostalgia, you know. Yeah. Do you have favorite memories from your time with uh, the Warriors? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, for me, it was like, I didn't want to come here, right? Really? <laughs> I mean, now everybody want to come here, but I didn't want to come here. I was getting traded to New Orleans. And it was like, uh, Golden State, Minnesota, and somebody else. And they were like, all right, we're going to trade you to Golden State. I was like, hell no, I'm not going there. <laughs> they are terrible. They are horrible. You know what I mean? Like, what am I going to do? What am oh I going to do over there? And then the trade deadline was approaching, and it was like five minutes, like two minutes. I was like, fuck it, dude. Just trade me to go this day. I was like, <laughs> Get me out of here. But when I got here, it was like, no, no lie. When I got here, I used to always describe it like, like it was, it was just the most depressed thing I had. Like it was like basketball was dead, dude. You're looking. You know what I mean? Jay Rich was hurt. Troy Murphy would walk into practice like this every day. Mike Dunleavy was just like working. Like he was like the only dude that was like working out, oh, but was frustrated. And then like they had lost. They had lost so many games. Like I didn't even know what the record was, right? <laughs> so I got to the team. I was like, man, uh, like. What's going on? And, and the coach Mike Montgomery, who is like not the brightest, not the brightest like <laughs> basketball mind, but you know he did coach at Stanford, so he's it's true. He should be intelligent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> go Bruins, go Bruins, my fault, no fault. No, no. um, no, but it was like a, it was like, man, it was just like dead in there. And I was like, damn, dude, like, what am I gonna do here? And we started, like, when I first got there, we, when I started playing, we won uh, 10 of the last, like, 11 games. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, we, and we had won, like, eight in a row. And it was, uh, no, we won nine in a row. And uh, I was like, player of the week for two weeks. It was like, boom. And I was like, damn, dude, it was, you know, like 20, you know, 20,000 plus in the arena. But they was there when, when, when I got there. And I was like, yo, this is probably going to be an amazing place. And then uh, we played San Antonio Spurs the next, the next game. And I went to the baseball game. I was hanging out. I was like, man, we won eight in a row. That's enough. We want to give them too much. And uh, the next year, we sucked. And then we uh, got the trade with Steven Jackson. And then that was the whole, you know, we believe thing. So for me, it was just like, you know, you coming into a city and you don't know. You know, I always, being from L.A., I always had, you know, we, we beef a lot. I don't know if y'all know that. It was like on all levels, you know, tag, basketball, content, you know, just style. And so I didn't really know how the Bay Area would, you know, uh, receive me or how much I would like it. Man, I fell in love. You know what I mean? The only time that I wanted to leave was during the summertime, mm -hmm. you know, because most coldest winter I've of ever course. had is a day in San Francisco. Yeah. Somewhere in San Francisco. Yeah, very cool. Talk about getting traded. I think Wikipedia, where I did some of my research yesterday, uh, <laughs> said that you were thrilled to come to Golden State because you always wanted to come back to California, and that's not so. So Well, no, nah, you know what? When I thought about it, I was like, damn, I could be in Minnesota. Like, that's freezing. Like, nah. <laughs> you know what? Send me to Oakland, dude. At least they got good weather. You know, I, I, and I had really... I didn't know anything yeah. about the Bay Area. Like, in all ignorance, all I knew was like Cal, Stanford. I didn't know anything, you know? And, and so, like, it was almost like an enlightening moment for me to, like, I, uh, to come in innocent, not knowing anything. And so I just kind of, like, absorbed the culture, and the culture absorbed me. Very cool. What do you remember about that culture that really stuck with you, about the area, the people, the culture, anything specific? Everybody was so friendly, okay. right? It was, um, and I think that's why, you know, ultimately it's easy to come here and, and be a basketball star because, you know, people see you on the street, they say, what's up, give you dap, keep it pushing, they take a picture, but it, it, it wasn't, you know, it was like more like your peers, right? It was like you going to work and you just seeing people and, you know, people are super cool share ideas, you know, people are more interested in 
all the other things that I was doing or what are the things that I was interested in. And so for me, uh, I live right in uh, South of Market um, by like Harlot, John College, yeah. all, you know, all the clubs. Um, <laughs> You know, just to stay on top of everything, but it, you know, you. St- <laughs> but it was like, you know, it was, it was a cool community of people, and then that's when I really started like getting into like tech and, mm-hmm. you know, wanting to, you know, wanted to use my brand to like find people to, you know, leverage leverage what I could do to 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 one give back first and foremost. We've been looking forward to having you for weeks now, talking to people. Hey, Baron Davis is coming. Baron Davis is coming. I keep hearing two things. One. He's my favorite warrior of all time. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate that. And, and two, I hear. There's only like four people are like, yeah. <laughs> and two, I keep hearing, you know, when he came to town, <laughs> he really sparked something that's carried the Warriors into this new era, three championships. Do you feel that transition? Like you guys really sparked something? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, it's belief, right? When I got here, like I said, it was dead, dude. And I was like, shit, dude. Like, damn. <laughs> Flatline, right? Seriously. That was us. And, um, and I was just like, man, it, st- it started with belief, right? And so you got to, it can't just be the dudes on the team. You got to figure out, you know, what the assistants are doing with the team manager. Like, let's, what's the story, right? And so, you know, for me, it was just like really digging down deep and finding out what the story was, what we could do you know, and like what we could really like give back to the team, right? And yeah. so once we figured that out, it became like, you know, it became easier to like put on. Okay. You know what I mean? And, and to walk in that arena and know, all right, this is how we're gonna turn this thing around. So it was it was all with the belief in people. And then when we got Steven Jackson and Al Harrington, it was just like, all right, we gotta believe in ourselves. And I don't know if y'all remember, but like when they first came, we sucked. And then I got and then I got hurt, and Nelly kind of gave up, and you know pretty much everybody else on the team gave up too, and uh, I never forget. I was like, "Yo, I'm coming back," and they're like, "Why are you coming back? Season's over." I was like, "Dude, because we can't have something special, right? If we can just change our mentality from partying in the club <laughs> to partying on the court, mm-hmm. right? Let's make this the party, right? Let's make this the party, like dog." Ain't 20,000 people showing up in the club. It's like 500 people. Sometimes it's high, sometimes it's not. But it's 20, you know, it's 20,000 people in the arena. If we make this our, our party and we, we party hard here and we have as much fun, then anything is possible. And that's when the We Believe happens. I like right? that. And so I think that kind of sparked the community to be like, hold on, like, we've been waiting for this. You know what I mean? Like, we the best at... You know, we're the best at fandom. We're the best at supporting our team. We got the rock in arena. And when that shit turned up, dude, it was just like, it was phenomenal. It was like you walking into the arena already at an advantage, yeah. like a superhero. You know what I mean? Yeah. You pulling into the parking lot and it don't even, you don't even care who you playing. You see people barbecuing and shouting you out. You're like, man, we whoever it is, we about to smoke them. You know what I mean? <laughs> So it was just like, you know, I think it, 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 we were kind of like catalyst to the belief, right? Yeah. And then, um, you know, when the new regime of ownership, and you know, you got to have something to build on. And I think that belief and that whole we believe thing is something that, you know, people will never forget. I like your answer because I remember thinking uh, that it was both, it was two ways, that it, it always looked like you were one of the catalysts, one of the emotional cores of the team, inspiring people to believe, but it looked like you fed off of it too. Was that, was it two ways? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I think uh, the whole team fed, fed off of it. Cause at that point, uh, like we were not in the playoffs. Like we were not gonna make the playoffs. We needed to win like 20, you know, 20 or 25 games. I think we went like 21 or 22, I don't even know. Mm. Something like that. And it was like once, I was like, yo dog, imagine if we got to the playoffs, like, that's like winning a championship here, dog. We can like, like imagine what that party would be like. I was like, yo, if we make it to the playoffs, I'm throwing the biggest party in San Francisco because my birthday at the end of the season. I was like, and we made the playoffs in Portland. And then our last game was against Minnesota. I had a birthday party, dude. It was like 7,000 people. I don't know where that shit was. It was like a warehouse. And it was booming. Um, 
But it was just like, man, it was like, yo, if we keep if we keep going, any you know, any kind of anything and everything is possible. But it was like all all the odds were stacked against us. Yeah. And you know, we kind of came together, and and when we start coming together, and we start winning the city start coming together, right? And the fans start coming together. And then we start hanging, you know, we start hanging out, Harlot, John Collins, you know, with our you know, our peers, but it was like they were fans, but as soon as we walked off the court, we were regular people, right? And 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 that's I think that's what gave us the confidence to keep going. And look, I mean, I think uh, at the time, the first and maybe the only number eight seed to topple a number one seed yeah. with the MVP, Dirk Nowitzki, Dallas Mavericks, uh, first time that happened in the in the, in the seven game format for the first mm-hmm. round of the playoffs, and then there's the dunk. Yeah. I don't know how how often you talk about the dunk on Karolinka. I mean, everybody talk about oh, it yeah. every day. Oh yeah. People talk about it every how day. How like people it's in, this, in this room screamed at their TV, took their shirt off, ran out in the street. I took my shirt off. Uh, I tried. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that? What was it like? What was your mentality leading up to that moment? Uh, I always say, like, I knew I was going to dunk on him. Because <laughs> he winked at me. He did? Okay. Yeah, he winked at me. He literally winked at me. And if you watch, uh, like, the play before, I think it was two plays before, I went to the hole, and he was there, and I laid it up. And he was like, okay, like, excuse my language. He was like, all right, motherfucker, do it again. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I know y'all love and having a good time. Like, you know, don't play me. You know, Karolinko, like, you don't play Karolinko. He gonna block it. <laughs> so I was like, okay. Like, I, I, you know, it was like an acknowledgement. He was like, all right, I got you. Like, dog, don't do that again. I was like, hey, man, you know, don't trap my fault, dog. You know, I ain't gonna rub it in. <laughs> and so I was like, yo, I'm about to, like, he was on the other side of the basket, yeah. right? So I did the same move, right? And I was like, when I saw him, I was like, oh, shit, I got him. I was like, I got him, because I got off the floor before him. And so when I did it, when I dunked, I was like, dude, if I made this shit, dude, I, and like, I don't even know what happened. I was like, yo, if I made this shit, dude, I'm telling you. And that's what, what was happening all in the moment. And so when I looked up, I see my teammates running over like, oh, shit. And so I'm like, oh. And I just like pulled my shirt up like, ah, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then I like went back to like being cool, you know, the oh, cool yeah. beating. Like, oh, you know, that wasn't nothing. And like I'm seeing dudes like, oh, my God, what the fuck happened? And I'm like, yo. I was like, shit. But it was one of those things like, no, seriously, it was one of those things. I was thinking about all this shit. And I was like, damn, dude. I'm like, but if I do, like, so, you know, Steven Jackson, like, wiping me down. I'm like, shit, dude, did I just, like, fuck myself? You know what I mean? And, like, become, like, the dude who's only known for, like, dunking on, like, oh, boy. This, is, is, this is going to be the most defining moment in my in my career. And I, like... You're having these thoughts on the floor. Oh, the, the whole thing. I was like, damn, dude. You missed that free throw. You realized that, right? Yeah, I'm telling you. I'm sure I did, dude. <laughs> this is all the stuff that's going on in my head. All right. I'm like, damn, dog, I'm, be- I'm a better player than this fucking dunk, but this dunk was, like, epic. And so, like, <laughs> shit. And so it's like this, you know, and that's what haunts my life. It, like, keeps me alive and keeps me relevant, but at the same time, it's like, hey, man, like, hey, man, I see you dunk on Karolinka. I was like, damn, that shit was, like, 20 years ago. <laughs> That was pretty good, too, but like it. So we're learning something. If you dunk on Andre Karolinko, game three of the West semifinals, it's going to haunt you for the rest of your life. Oh, it's going to, yeah. Oh, my God. Basically. So, <laughs> you know, I have it here. I was going to ask you, was that your your defining moment? Was that your hot <laughs> I have it here. I think we're going to skip that question. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's change it up for a sec here. <laughs> Something that I always, always really loved about you and admired is when you went to Cleveland, you wore number 85. Mm-hmm. I wore 85 as a receiver for the okay. Diamond Bells okay. in San Jose. Okay. 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 You're an athlete who always remembers your roots growing up on 85th Street in the L.A. area. Um, what was the toughest part about getting from there to being a two-time NBA All-Star? Um, survival, hmm. right? So I say, as a kid, you should never have to survive. Right. And so when you're waking up every morning, you're not thinking about where you're going. You're thinking about how to get to sleep to wake up the next day. 
And so I think that was the hardest part as a kid is like you're seeing people every day surviving, mm -hmm. right? They're living for the next day. They're living to the next week. And there's not a lot of resources, right, that are opportunities that's building any kind of like enlightenment or anything like anything that happens that if a, if some positive happened, oh, you best believe something two or three negative things. Right. And so for me, it was like looking at that, looking at um, my grandmother. Right. And my grandfather and looking at how they were able to just live and be, right? And create a foundation where it was up to you if you wanted to survive or not. I mean, you know what I mean? It was like, you don't have to survive. You can have a nice home, you can have great rules, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I watched like, you know, the generation, my parents' generation and uncles, I watched them um, not really respect that. And so their lives took a turn. And so for me as a kid, I saw everything, you know what I mean? So, and so if, if, I, if I may, your grandparents opened up the idea that you could you could have something beyond that, beyond survival. Yeah, it was just you know like even though you live in the hood and you live in the house, make sure your house clean, mm. right? Make sure it's spick and span, right? Make sure you know, make sure you are presentable, you're a gentleman, you clean cut. Everything that my grandmother taught me and my grandfather taught me was in preparation to be, you know, the person that I'm supposed to be, right? And so society is telling me I ain't shit, but my grandparents is telling me, like, you're incredible, yeah. right? And all you got to do is take care of these fundamental things as well as have these, you know, um, these life qualities, right? This, these, the the professionalism and a, and, and a gentleman's etiquette, right? That's going to propel you past all of the bullshit. I like that. I don't think I've read before. What about your grandparents, you know, made them that way, made them teach you that stuff? Well, I think for them, uh, you know, they, they struggle through a lot. They struggle through uh, raising their kids and having their kids on, you know, drugs. Some kids get locked up for life in prison. So they lived it, right? And so, you know, I think that religion, right, was the thing that kept them together, right? And, 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 and kept them moving on, kept them moving, you know, forward and forward. But, you know, seeing their kids, like, now that I have kids, right, it's like seeing your kids as adults and then feeling a sense of, you know, f there's some sense of failure and accountability on both ends. And as the grandkid, seeing this relationship and trying to figure out what it means, right, to them and what it means to, you know, my parents, like, it was confusing, right? Mm -hmm. But my grandparents always made it safe, right? Mm -hmm. So you knew you had a safe place, you had a clean place, you had food on your table, you have to do your homework, you got to go to school, you know, you got to do all the other stuff. But, you know, when you're with your parents, it's like, shit, you don't know what, you don't know what's going on, you know what I mean? You don't know if you go going to school for a week or, you know, you may just be hanging out at the park. You know, I remember uh, a lot of times, and this is why people say, damn, you never sleep. Well, when I was a kid, you know, I used to hang, I used to be there and, you know, in the group, and you'd be at the park and from 12 to 4 in the morning, and it's like three or four other kids. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, so you, you, you live with those things, you remember those things, you see those things, but you're dying to get back to your grandparents, right? And that's the foundation. They build a safe haven where we can always go to. That's amazing. You have two kids? I have two kids. I think uh, I, I was looking at your Instagram the other day. I'm like I, waiting for a picture of them oh, yeah. come on. <laughs> right? right? <laughs> Not today, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> They're um, great. They're great. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I haven't seen too many athletes, frankly, especially male athletes, who have so many pictures of their kids. Obviously, parenthood's super important. Fatherhood's yeah. super important to you. What's it been like being a dad? I mean, it's been everything. I tell you, like, uh, like Instagram, I put, like, people are like, damn, dude, I always see a kid. And I'm like, shit. Like, how do people see my kid? And I remember, like, every time... I'm like getting ready to post something on Instagram. I'm like, damn, I ain't post. 
I only have pictures of my kids. So it's just like, I just post pictures of my kid and I forget. But um, for me, I've learned so much through my kids. It's given me freedom to be a kid again. Again. Um, you know, it's given me the freedom to like learn and listen and explore. And so, you know, um, I mean, that's probably the best thing that I've ever done in my life, yeah. right? Or will ever do. And, wow. um, Better than the dunk on Karolinka. Man, way better than the dunk on Karolinka. Way better. And I just laugh because I think I think everybody here would agree. We always thought of you and continue to think of you as somebody who was fun-loving, wasn't afraid to ask questions, to listen to people, to be a kid. So it must be pretty amazing to now relive that with your own kids. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's, it's tremendous. I mean, you learn a lot. You learn a lot because they're listening to it, so you better be careful what you say, right? Okay, fair enough. I'll tell you that. If for parents, new parents out there, be careful what you say. Right? Fair enough. They will use it against you. <laughs> so, um, obviously, you've been an analyst now for a while with Turner, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you a couple of questions about the current state of the NBA. And, uh, one thing you already alluded to is the Bay Area is starting to become a real target destination. It used to be South Beach, LA, New York, and now, I mean, KD and Boogie, obviously the Warriors are doing well, but do you really think Silicon Valley is gonna sustain itself as a long-term NBA destination? Uh, definitely, you know, I think they have great management, great ownership, um, and they have great players. And, you know, players wanna play with good players, and they're winning and they do it um, with great style, uh, with great professionalism, yeah. and you know, can't ask for a better situation, right? If you're, if, if you're playing basketball and you're trying to play on the highest stage at the highest level. Now I wanna ask you this too, because you played for some non-big market teams, obviously the Knicks, the Clippers, the Warriors, but you played for Cleveland right after LeBron left. Um, yes. At, right? <laughs> New Orleans, Charlotte, as an analyst, and by the way, you mentioned not wanting to go to Minnesota. You are looking at the largest Minnesota Timberwolves fan in the Bay Area. I like Minnesota, okay. man. I like the hamster wheels and all that. I could have dealt with that. I could have dealt with that in, okay. the, in, the, uh, in the winter time. If Derrick Rose goes down, they could use a backup player. Hey, man. Hey. Count me in. All right. You heard it here first, all right? Count me in, Thibodeau. Look, I used to play NBA Live. The first thing I do is trade Baron Davis to the T-Wolves every time as my point guard. Hey, with KG. See. How do you feel for these teams, these small market teams, Minnesota, New Orleans, uh, Milwaukee, I worry about them if they can't get people for Giannis. How do you, as a player, do you worry about the, the equity for those teams? Those markets, not at all. No. Okay. <laughs> I mean, dude, just hire better management. Okay. Pick better guys. You know, it's like, I'm not going to feel sorry for anybody, right? You, you, you know, um, a lot of these teams are uh, tanking. Um, they're hiring uh Sorry, like data analysts to like <laughs> <laughs> figure out if somebody's good or not. Like, I'm sorry, I mean, it, it, all you have to do is watch somebody play, right? Um, <laughs> and then say, is he gonna be good for three years doing that, or can he do that for him? Like, the data is just gonna say, oh shit, there's a mark on the court, he makes shots from there, da 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 da. So they have to do a better job of bringing in the right management, drafting the right players, trading for the right players, and managing your budget, right? Is there's a there's a ton of good players, right? Yeah. How does a player go from, you know, um, nothing to something? How does somebody go from sugar to shit? It's all about the team that they're on, right? And so, you know, a lot of these general managers and people, you get somebody like Giannis and then you panic. Right. Instead of understanding, you know, what what are the pieces I need to put a, around Giannis? Right. And so when you look at a mil, uh, the Milwaukee Bucks and you look at that team, is that the right team for him? Right. So they should have probably started doing that shit two years ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> Minnesota. Oh, boy. Um, your team. Yeah. You know, just a little breakdown. Did Jimmy Butler leave? No, he's going to, though. OK, yeah, because he probably should. <laughs> to be honest. I hear you, man. Um, you know, it's like, look, you got Wiggins, you got Towns. And now you go and get Jimmy Butler. Mm -hmm. And then uh, who's the point guard? 
the Teague. Teague. Do any four like if if you were picking like NFL uh, NBA 2K, would you put those four players on the team? Again? No. Like everybody wants the ball. It's the Timberwolves. Yeah. Man. It's yeah. Like Thibodeau and the Timberwolves. Yeah. Okay. And then you hire Thibodeau yeah. to be the GM and the coach. Mm-hmm. And I mean, if you guys don't know who Tom Thibodeau, he sweats like. <laughs> Thinking about basketball. <laughs> Dreaming about it every Man, that's all he does. Oh, yeah. He's like 24-7 basketball, and so he's giving out the checks. Yeah. So one day he loves you, the next day he's going to change house. you. You can't, give, you can't give a coach that much power, right? Either you're the ge- general manager or the coach, because um, a general manager is not going to fire himself, no. and the coach is not going to fire himself. No. Sounds like you might have a future in management. Uh, yeah, once we kind of get all our, once I get rich, this guy's, gonna, <laughs> this guy right here, he's, he, he's going to make me rich. Okay. <laughs> um, we got to talk really quick about super teams. Judging by your previous answer, I don't think you care too much about teams that aren't super teams. You're not worried about Katie coming to the dubs. I, I mean, I think about, like, playground. I mean, if he, yeah, if he went somewhere else, I would have had, like, a lot of shit to say. But he came to the dub, so I don't really have much to say. OK. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, what about the GOAT? I could be wrong. I feel like I've, I've seen you say that LeBron's the GOAT. No. OK, no. <laughs> I said he is a GOAT. I said he is a GOAT. OK. Like, the GOAT. Um, the re- I say LeBron is a GOAT because of who he is as a person, what he's been able to do. Um, both on the court and off the court, right? And for this, you know, as the evolution of the athlete grows, right? So does our fandom, so does our celebrity. And I think that he's done an excellent job of, you know, taking basketball and taking who he is as a person and building both at the same time. And when you think of LeBron James, you, you know, even if you're not a basketball fan, you appreciate and respect him. Uh, as the man, uh, as a businessman, you know, as a father and all that. So, you know, to me, that's why I said, you know, that's why I give him GOAT status so early because he's actually, like, you know, taking every every sense of the word of a superstar from the time he's landing in the league, and he's never disappointed us. Mm And as far as, I like that answer, GOAT overall, but as far as a basketball GOAT goes, do you care about the rings? Do you need six? Do you need seven? Are you out of that debate? It's just, man, it's like, take, you know, it's, 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 it's Michael Jordan is 6-0 and in the finals. Hard to beat. Who else is 6-0 and in the finals? Was Bill Russell? Bill Russell got 11. And he was not 6-0, and though. That's he true. lost a couple. But, you know. Bill Russell, you got Kareem, you got Michael Jordan, you got LeBron, you got Magic, you got Bird, you got Dr. J. Um, you know, it's hard to have these com- conversations, right? It's, it's great to have them. Okay. And, because, and I think that the media has these conversations because they don't have nothing else to talk about, right? Um, <laughs> And so when you look in on the news, it's like, oh, LeBron said he, oh, Scottie Pippen said, oh, it's like the same conversation. Dude. I hear you. But like these, these guys, I like to think of, think of them as artists, right? And okay. a lot of these guys are like one of ones, right? And so, you know, Michael Jordan will never, ever, ever be duplicated. Neither will Iceman George Gerving, neither will Larry Bird, right? And so for me, I kind of give them their own kind of superhero GOAT status because it's hard to play in the sport and transcend the sport to where people know who you are by how you play, yeah. right? And they figure out your personality by how you play. Cool. I'm going to ask you one more basketball question. Um, I don't know how you feel about this, but you were there for Linsanity. And oh, man, that was like the craziest shit ever. Dude. Yeah. That was like the worst thing that, that was like the worst thing ever, dude. It was like, the wor- it was like being a part, it, it was like being a part of the worst thing ever. <laughs> I mean, it was so great. You know what I mean? It was like, but like to be like, to be the teammate, it was just like, dude, are you, is this really happening? That's how we felt, yeah. And like after every game, I would go to Mike D'Antoni, like the first game, 
because uh, I was like, Coach, you got to put him in, dude. He's the, only one that, he's the only one who goes north and south until I come back. So I was all, like, it was like, I'm supposed to come back, play for the Knicks. Jeremy Lin was there, and I was like, Coach, I can't do it. Jeremy Lin plays in Houston. He scores six points, has three assists in garbage time. But he had more than, like, Shump, who was a rookie, and uh, Tony Douglas, who was just struggling playing the point guard role. Mm-hmm. So after the Houston game, I was like, Coach, man, you got to play him. He was like, man, I ain't playing on Jeremy Lane. That was garbage time. I was like, he's the only one that goes north and south. If anything, if we can get six points and three assists somewhere in the game, we wouldn't be getting blown out, right? (laughs) So I'm like, Coach, but give me a week. He was like, man, I ain't got a week. I'm going to lose my job. I was like, well, shit, I can't help you, dog. (laughs) So I'm like working out. Melo gets hurt. And I'm like working out, and we're watching the Brooklyn Nets game. Oh boy! And I'm in the lock. I'm in the locker room, and he puts Jeremy Lin in. I'm like, come on, Jeremy Lin, let's go. And he scores. Boom! Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, man. Make me look good. Six points. Boom! 18, 22. I'm like, oh shit, dude! Like we won. <laughs> Dude's running in the locker room. Like the Knicks ain't never felt like that. They lift him, lifting him up. So Coach D'Antoni, I was like, man, he was like, ah, get out of my face. <laughs> Come back the next game, right? Yeah. So he's like, you know, come back the next game. But the morale is up, right? Melo's still out. The morale is up. I'm coming back. But everybody's like, yo, this is fucking great. Like, this is the best thing about basketball. It doesn't matter who you are. But if you are the least likely person to help the team win, like, everybody was just like, he was just like the darling, right, for the day. Then the next game, he had another good game. Wow, this is amazing. This is what winning feels like, guys. Two in a row. <laughs> all, all along, Dan Tony comes in like, well, shit. Uh, second game, he goes, huh. <laughs> Third game, he was like, OK, dude, we about to play like the Lakers or something. I think we were, no, we went to Toronto. And we played Toronto. And that's when he hit the game the winner. winner. So it was like all the drama was building towards this dude having the last second shot. And he fucking made it. It was wide, wide. And it was like, Top of the no game. way, dude. Yeah. It was like, no way, dude. And like everybody on the team was like, yo, this is crazy. So we rushed the court. It was just like, dude. And you know, Jeremy Lin is like, he is the anti, like he is the anti brand of what you would think of, you know, a superstar or an athlete. Like, Christian sleeps on his brother couch. It was like the <laughs> best story ever. Story. And like we get back to New York, dude, and I swear to God, before the next game, the media room was like he had to go. He couldn't even be in the locker room. Oh, yeah. There was this much media in the locker. And everybody was like, You shitting me, right? You shitting me, right? <laughs> and we played the Lakers, so it was like, all right, man, Kobe coming to the garden. Kobe going to bust his bubble. So, uh, you know, I'm still out. So I go to the Laker locker room. I'm like, Kobe, man, you better not let this dude bust your ass, dude. I swear swear to God, you better not let this dude bust your ass. He was like, yeah, I got him. I said, all right, dude. I said, all right, dude. I'm telling you. Like, he on the road. Ah, Kick the Lakers' ass. Once he kicked the Lakers' ass, it was over, dude. He could not go anywhere in New York. People were calling me from LA, like, yo, like, what's up with Jeremy Lin? Like, what do you mean, what's up with Jeremy Lin? Is he dating somebody? Like, dude, get the fuck off my mind. What are you talking about? So Dan Tony comes in, and uh, I'm like, dude, I, he was like, man, this boy, he, he got fucking angels in the outfield. And so I was like, yeah, this is. I was like, dude, this is angels in the outfield. Okay. And so I think we won like three or like uh, another game or so. And then uh, Melo came back, and then we lost. And then like. <laughs> He's going back to D. No, we lost the game. We lost the game, but it was like because we played against Brooklyn again, and Darren Williams wasn't having that shit. (laughs) He just wasn't having it. You know what I mean? So it was just like, uh uh-oh. Okay, now the smoke is coming. Like he, man, I'm telling you, dog. It was it was only like two weeks. It was the biggest shit I've ever seen in my life. It was like it was like being on the team with Michael Jordan times ten for two weeks. (laughs) 
Like, it was this amount of media in the locker to where it was like, come on, dude, like, please. Like, you can't get dressed. It was just like, dude, just go fucking, go get another locker with all these, like, it was the craziest thing I've ever, it was great, but at the same time, I was like, yo, this is like, this can't last, right? Like, this can't last. And it didn't. Like, once we played Miami and LeBron and them, and right before All-Star Game, they were like, basically like they wouldn't even let the dude like get on the court to warm up they were like salivating at the mouth like come on dude let's go we about to shut him up and that was the end of insanity okay (laughs) i'm gonna ask baron one more question so if you want to start going up to the mic for audience q a feel free to go ahead um you brought this up in your answer just now that's the greatest thing about basketball this nobody this unexpected hero steps up good game good game good game When you and I talked on the phone a couple weeks ago, you told me that your thesis in life and in business now is, I believe in underdogs. Can you talk about that and what you're doing after your NBA career with with underdogs? Uh, So for me, uh, you know, opening up a venture studio, uh, marketing, creative business strategy, full production and platform building, and looking at athletes as content makers, right? Looking at content makers as content makers, right? Um, Looking at all the things that I that I had to go through to reinvent myself, right? I want to be a movie producer and, and produce films. And it's like, you go to the studio and go like, uh, no, no. I'm like, no, what the fuck you mean? This shit is hot. So it was like, why can't we say yes, right? And, you know, wanted to build a, you know, build a platform and, and also have, you know, venture capabilities to be able to find the next wave of talent, right? To be able to give access to, um, the minority, whatever, whatever you are, right? You know, it's, uh, the minority is, is somebody who's just basically being like told that you can't do some shit that you know you can do. And so, you know, just building a company and building a brand off of, you know, um, connecting the dots, right? Packaging the dots, right? And then fueling the dots with the right people and the right capital and the right team right, to get successes and wins, right? Because it's not, you know, not everybody's gonna be the Golden State Warriors in, you know, tech. Not every, you know, they're, they're, nobody's gonna be the, you know, the big you know, major investment firm. But I think that if we make smart decisions and know what we are and who we are, and, um, you know, using sports as the landscape and also as, you know, kind of like my, my business school, I can apply that to pretty much any industry, knowing where, you know, my talents of connectivity and uh, where we're smart at. And I just want to say, I mean, you've taken that thesis, that goal to help uh, people who are underserved or minorities or underdogs. You're doing a lot. There's yeah. BIG, Business Inside the Game, yeah. there's Black Santa Company. Do you want to mention any of that? Or Yeah, so Business Inside the Game is, uh, you know, I have a... Uh, I had a lot of just contacts and and just know a lot of people and I was and I would start uh, I got on the circuit for uh, like the VC summit circuit and all that shit and um, I was just like man this shit hella boring like <laughs> I can't be doing this the whole time so I'll go a day and I leave like man this this is the same information and so I created business inside the game based on the notorious B.I.G. because that stamp for business instead of game. And so I was like, yo, we need to have summits and dinners and, you know, mixers where it's us, right? Where it's the next generation of people that are not getting the access to these stiff crowds. Like, I don't want to be in the 1%. You know what I mean? Because, like, that ain't cool. I ain't nothing, you know, I, like, I don't drink wine like that. I don't, like, shoot quail, all that shit. I don't do none of that. You know, I play, I play, I play video games and, like, you know, I make music. So it's... Yeah. But there's musicians, there's athletes, there's, you know, COOs, right, that are ready to leave. And so it was like for business inside the game is we want to create a platform where the culture has an opportunity to share their wins, right? And the culture has an opportunity to connect and build partnerships and, um, you know, just build friendships through a database of kind of like a well-manicured database of executives, athletes, people who are cultured and and who know what their next best business move is. Um, You wish uh, I trademarked Black Santa because um, I am obsessed with Walt Disney and I felt uh, as a creative, like nobody would really uh, 
respect me as a creative until I created something. And so uh, created Black Santa, and that's due to launch um, this uh, Christmas. But the thought around it was there are no representation of color, right, in animation. Right there, and so as a kid growing up, going back to survival, right? How can I get the and 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 when you think about what that survival leads to, from a police brutality standpoint, the things that we're going through from a social justice standpoint, it's because that kid don't see himself in the cartoons. That little girl don't see herself as a princess, right? And so from that, you know, I wanted to attack you know, the most low-hanging fruit, and that was Santa Claus. He got $56 billion worth of equity built into him, and it was just like, hey, man, you need a competitor. Um, somebody who's cool and cultured, and I think that, you know, we, we're launching You Wish, which is, you know, a storytelling platform for, you know, um, storytellers and creators to be able to tell stories of, you know, diversity and, you know, uh, basically about, you know, we celebrate culture, we celebrate heritage, and we, we, t we express that through storytelling. Very cool. And then Slick is, obviously, I'm an athlete, so sports, lifestyle, and culture, uh, that's a platform we're launching, and that's really for athletes to engage, or content makers to engage in, like, the cool things around the lifestyle of sport, the lifestyle of music and entertainment conversion on a platform because we feel that through sports we have so many connectivities and touch points why isn't basketball why isn't sport considered culture and so that's what we're building uh with slip very cool thanks for coming today baron Thank um you, quick question for you could you talk about your experience playing in the big three league and uh any uh, future potential you see for that league where do you where do you see it heading uh it's a great league um you know they foul a lot they foul a lot <laughs> But uh, I think Ice Cube's doing a great job. Um, you know, it's just showing that, you know, the game that we're playing basketball is expanding. Um, and there's room for disruption. There's room for opportunity. Summer basketball is, um, you know, an untapped market because uh, the NBA hardly, barely ever plays in that, in that time frame. But when you look at basketball as a global sport, um, you know, it's continuing to, you know, reach high limits. And I think something like the big three, when you have retired guys who still can play or still think they can play or should be on the Warriors for one year and get a championship, <laughs> something like that, you know, then it gives us a chance to kind of just showcase what we do. But, you know, whether we go back to the NBA or get a job overseas or just fulfill that, you know, kind of fulfill that nugget for the summer, I, I think it's, uh, we're definitely on to something with that. Thank you. This is a little bit on a funnier note, but uh, when you made that comedy series, like the Baron Davis comeback, uh -huh. and uh, Steve Nash told you he doesn't eat pizza, what was going through your mind? <laughs> like, what the fuck do you mean? You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hate Steve Nash, by the way. <laughs> because of that. Because that should make me look fat. You know what I mean? <laughs> All right. <laughs> do you actually get to eat pizza during the season, or like, do you like try to refrain? I eat pizza all the time. No, I just do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. That's what I like. <laughs> I'm retired. <laughs> uh, thanks for making Bay Area Thank you. basketball run. I need a, a YouTube TV channel, don't you think? <laughs> Make it out the bag. What to do with the bag? Never mind. All right. <laughs> Um, I remember growing up, going to the games to watch Thunder, the mascot. Yeah, and rest in was, peace, right? Yeah. No, no, no. no I, well, no, he the died. second one. He, I went to school with him. He was, oh, okay. Yeah, he's well, still the rest, one before him yeah, passed peace, away. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, I mean, you, you came through and we're like, well, we could watch people play basketball, not just the mascot. Uh, but how is uh, your relationship with the rest of the We Believe team? Like, oh, we still hang out. We still, we all in the group chat. Uh, we do business together. Uh, we, uh, a couple of us playing on the big three, so. You know, we, we, we stay down for each other. C.J. Watson just got married. We was all at his wedding, you know, turning up. So, you know, shit don't stop, it don't stop. It's a brotherhood, you know? It, it's a brotherhood. So, you know, for me, I, I know I got a responsibility to those dudes because we had something special. So I check on everybody and keep them around. Well, thank you. And uh, one day I hope you end up on uh, Inside the NBA with Shaq in them. What, thank you, man. So. I hope one day before that I end up on the Warriors give me a championship. So I <laughs> I'm 
Okay. I had a quick question. As someone who invests a lot in everything from media to new technology, how do you evaluate if something is worth your time and energy to invest in? Um, I think the way that we look at it is, you know, how can we help? How can we support? Right? So um, I think listening for me is the most important thing to see where we can kind of plug and play with the company, right? So I'm sure different than a lot of other, you know, investors or in venture funds, you know, they'll give you money and say, go. You know, uh, it's hard for us to give you money, right? So we're always looking at, you know, what do you need? How does this make sense for us? How does this make sense in the marketplace? And then if we can plug in and support from what we do, then that's where we make the investment. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Baron. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Richard. I'm from LA as well. Okay, that's Long what I'm talking about. Bruin fan. And, Dodgers. Uh, yes, sir. Dodgers. That's right. Lakers. The Lakers. <laughs> I don't want to get rust in here, but you know. <laughs> Two part question. How did it feel when you went back home to play for the Clippers? Horrible. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Actually, I thought it. Was, you know, I looked at the Clippers. I thought it was gonna be the same as the Warriors. Like, give me three years, I'll be able to turn this thing around. And, you know, we kind of did, but uh, I didn't know what I was necessarily getting into. Uh, I just think that uh, it was it was a hundred times worse than walking into the Warriors, who were just, you know, just a bad organization and bad about, you know, bad at basketball management. The Clippers was just all fucked up, man. It was like <laughs> racist. It was, you know, racist, sexist, all kind of crazy weird shit was going on. Um, and for me, it was like, damn, like, how do you kind of navigate, right? How do you stand? How do you stand above all of this? And so, for me, it was probably the most trying time in my life. But uh, I think out of that, I became the most humble. Um, it was the most humbling experience for me, and it, it made my character stronger. Right. Also, lastly, uh, how about playing against Kobe? How was that? It was cool. <laughs> Saw Kobe get on this one. Hey, Baron. Uh, my name's Kyle, and I support the recruiting team. So uh, our intramural team starts this week. So if you want to join, we need a fifth person. You got some money? But uh, my question. You got some we money? Can, we can uh, we can find some. All right. But anyway. Pay for my plane ticket. Pay for my plane ticket, man. I'll be here. All right. I'll let you go. I'll, uh, I'll Do I get free food. lunch? Huh? Yeah. We get we got free food. If you want free food. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'll take you to the best places. But anyway, uh, if you could have one more epic highlight, uh, just on any person, past or present, who would you choose and why? Like one more epic uh, Caroline Kodunk or, uh, or crossover. I mean, who's the most famous NBA player now? I'd do something to him. Yeah, I'd dunk on him. <laughs> I'd dunk on LeBron since he's the most popular. That'd probably be it. Cool, thanks. I know that Kirilin Go Dunk uh, still kind of haunts you, like you were saying, but made me fall in love with the game. So Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Um, but you. wanted to know who was the toughest defender you faced and why? And then also, who was the one guy that tried to check you up and you would just think, oh, it's over? Like, this is, this is too easy. I mean, I hate to sound cocky, guys, but <laughs> nobody could guard me. So <laughs> I even make t shirts saying, can you guard me? I ask guys now in the NBA, can they guard me? So. To that question, the toughest defender was teams because uh, they would just kind of stack the deck. But individually, like nobody. Like I, I would love to have, like you know, I love when like it's a one, like when Kobe or you know, like uh, it, the best thing about the NBA is when guys start taking it personal, yeah. right? And it's like, man, I'm gonna check him. Like, oh, I got him. And it's like, oh, okay, like don't tell them to help and let's see what happens. <laughs> and so. <laughs> You know, like it's it. So it was it, to me. It didn't matter. Like I always had to, as a point guard, you got to play against your defender and you got to read, you know, uh, the other eight, right? So, or the other eight players, your players, their players. So my my responsibility was more about, you know, archetyping the game, um, than worried about like who was guarding me. Like now that was that was the least of my worries. Just out of curiosity, what is the best, most messed up trash talk you ever heard on the court? It's got to be KG. Uh, Gary Payton. It was my first year in the league. We were in Seattle. It was 12 o'clock. 
noon games are horrible for like NBA dudes, especially veterans, because they don't want to wake up. <laughs> and so I was like, damn, dude, I'm going to go in early, because all the vets is like, they don't like to wake up. They don't get loose till like 3 o'clock. And so I checked in the game with like two minutes after the game had started. And I was guarding Gary Payton. And, um, and he got, he got, somebody got fouled. He passed the ball on the post, somebody got fouled. And then like, we just standing right here and the dude's shooting the free throw. And the Seattle dude like, come on Seattle, wake up, supersonics, let's go. And it's nobody in the arena, dude. <laughs> He's like, come on guys, get fired up. We can take control. And Gary Payton said, hey, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Now sit down. <laughs> like this is all going on while somebody's shooting a free throw. And then like, let's go. <laughs> so that was like the worst. That was the worst I've ever seen. Like because I was I was scared. I was like, damn, dude, you can just talk to the fans. <laughs> He was like not having it. Gary Payton did not have his coffee that morning, and the dude was like had too much energy. He was like, "Sit your ass down." Shut up and sit your... That haunted me the whole game. I was like, "Damn." Man. Okay, thank you. Uh, hey, Baron. Uh, so, a uh, question about uh, uh, playoffs of 2007. So, back to then, Don Nelson was the head coach, and uh, he is probably the man who knows Dirk best. And so, I want to know. What's the impact he brought to the team and uh, what he helped you guys to win the series? Uh, he came to us before we played the first game and he said, yo, we're going to beat them. And I want you guys to be humble in the paper. I want you to praise them. I want you to say it's the most impossible thing. It's going to be the most impossible thing in the world. We we'll just keep downplaying it, but we're going to beat the shit out of them. And he basically. <laughs> You know, he knew the he knew Dirk and he knew Josh Howard. Those those are their two primary players. So he knew Dirk's moves and how what made Dirk comfortable scoring. And so once he gave that to us, Stephen Jackson took the challenge right to push him right. And if he pushed him right, he was going to spin back to shoot his fade away. If he went left, he would step away and shoot the fade or he would spin right for the layup. So all we, had to, all we had to do as soon as Dirk caught the ball is you play straight up, right? So you make him put the ball on the floor because you don't want him shooting over you. And he dribbles right. As soon as he dribbles right, when he spins back, somebody has to, no matter who, the next person better be there, either foul the shit out of him, die for the ball, but we should get a steal. And so that, when you watch the game, if you go back and watch the game, it was him and Josh Howard. And they were really like left-hand dominant guys who we were pushing to their right, right? Because they couldn't make all the decisions that they needed to. So credit to Don Nelson. Hey, Baron, just a quick question on leadership. You walked into some situations like you said, Warriors and the Clippers. As a leader and an elite athlete, I mean, and, and a leader, and even in the business world today, how do you determine to pick your battles? I mean, how do you, how do you determine? You walk in, I'm sure with Man. with the pull you have, you could say trade this guy, trade that guy. But how do you, you know, without becoming the the squeaky wheel too much? I'm curious how you manage. I, I mean, I think in order to, you got to learn everybody first, right? Um, you have to learn everybody, and then you have to learn yourself in the environment, right? Because Picking and choosing your battles in leadership is the most important thing, right? When to blow up, when to not. Like, you may blow up when you don't even have to, right? But if you have a, a, a leadership strategy, right, you're doing it for, you're always thinking future, right? And so when I look at, like, great leaders or coaches and things like that, it's, it's never about your moment, right, or never about how you emotionally feel about something or certain things. It's about where where is that gonna get you in your goals, right? And so how do you kind of manage yourself, right, um, in the environment? And I think the best way to do that is to learn everybody on the team, what they do, how they feel, how they feel about what, you know what I mean? And then as you insert yourself, you can really start to see how you can motivate people, see which, you know, like this, this guy right here, he probably doesn't do well if I yell at him, right? And so I need to learn, and you know, I need to learn that, but a lot of that comes from trial and error and listening, but it's also just 
more listening and paying attention to the people that your team and the people that you work with. How can I best support them? Because at that point, they're going to let me know how they best work. I, I just wanted to speak to your comment about um, data analysts. Um, <laughs> just, just because I found it really interesting that you said that um, you know in this data-driven world they they literally um, record data on everything, right? So, do you think in in analyzing all this data that it's um, created a more positive impact and in how to consider players and and you know team and recruiting talent, or do you think it's clouded judgment and and what do you think about that? I'll tell you this, I think, I don't think the teams really know what data is, right? Because they're not, I, they're not using it right, period, point blank. If you're using data to tell me that a dude made or missed a shot that he already took, <laughs> So you, watch him play, right? So you, like, shit, dude. OK, he's going to miss that. Like, you know, the, yeah. So data, it's like it's good information to. For projection. For, but it, it, it's tough because to me, it doesn't work, right? It, it, has, it, has, it has every place in the game for the fan, the fan experience, for the information of the team. But you cannot rely on data because you're taking away from the art of the game, right? And basketball is art and science, right? And when you see art, science, and performance at its perfection, you get Michael Jordan, you get LeBron James, you get Kobe Bryant, you get, ex you get the Golden State Warriors, you get excellent basketball, right? When you go data, you get teams like what the Philadelphia 76ers were for four years, right? And then a lot of the teams in the Midwest. And so they're hiding behind numbers, <laughs> right? They're, or smaller market teams, they're hiding it behind numbers and they're drafting and judging on numbers and shot charts and things like that when it's the data should, the data that they should be paying attention to is health, understanding, learning, um, you know, like their mental capacity, their range of explosion, Things like that are helpful, right? But it still doesn't take, it, it can't take away from the eye test, right? Because if the guy can play, he can play, right? He may have horrible stats in college, right? But may be the perfect fit at 6'9", 240, can shoot and dunk. But in college, he was horrible, right? Because the coach played him out of position. So a lot of the data, um, that's been drawn is really from, you know, you have to include everything, right? Is he playing on the right team? Is he playing for the right coach? Is that the right personality match? Is he in with the right guys? You know, the whole plus minus thing is like, if you're a smart player, like all you have to do is like tell the coach, like, hey man, my plus minus is gonna be, let me check out, right? You get a whole $50 million contract by being like the player with the best point, uh, plus minus in the league, right? But you probably ain't did shit for a team. You know what I mean? You ain't did nothing. You're no good. You ain't play. You just check in the game and know when to check out. And so you'll have more players doing that, right, to get contracts or saying, you know what, I probably shouldn't take this shot because, like, the data says. Or the coach say, yo, don't shoot that shot. And it's like, man, game on the line, 50-50 chance. Like, so what do you think about NBA and sports betting? Uh, that's going to be f interesting. Right. Fun I think so too. and interesting. Um, I think that, um, you know, people have been doing it illegally. I think legalizing it uh, is going to, it'll be interesting to see, like, how the different rules and all those things work. But I don't know. Can I gamble? <laughs> can I? I'm pretty sure you can. <laughs> Maybe that's a new profession. No, I'm joking. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure about gambling. That's going to be fun, though. It'll be fun. Baron, thanks so much for being here, man. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you.